So there were two things that I was frightened of. right that you wanted to see what was going on another was king kong that scared me you know this great big huge uh monster even though now when you look at the original king kong movie it's just this kind of goofy right <laughs> but anyway uh the special effects were not yet well developed for that uh but uh the next one uh that i particularly remember uh, was here I was already um, an ordained uh, minister, probably about 27 or 28. And you would think by then as an adult that you would have a, a different uh, approach to horror movies, knowing that they were not really real per se. Uh, but I remember uh, about 28 or so going to see The Exorcist. Um, and the reason why I went to see it is because coming from St. Louis in the true uh, part of the story, it started in, uh, in St. Louis, uh, where uh, the Jesuits of St. Louis University that I had graduated from uh, at, in college uh, were involved in this. And so it just seemed like, oh, I better go see this. Now, please don't laugh, but I'm 28 years old. And that night I had to sleep with the light on in my bed <laughs> because it so scared me. And here it, it's sort of like uh, the music um, in Jaws, whenever Jaws was getting ready to appear, you know. And you know, you knew that this, you know, the shark was going to come up with a big wide open mouth, you know, don't go near the ocean. <laughs> So it was like that with the exorcist, that the voice of, of the possess, uh, possessee or possessor, uh, just, well, anyway. And, and then probably about another, so now I'm in my 30s, and um, I went to see this movie, and I don't know if anybody else uh, saw it, uh, was Altered States. Good. <laughs> It's about this fellow who does this experiment on himself where he gets into one of those immersion uh, tanks, but he's also sucking on peyote. Um, and a part of the story is that he wanted to, quote, regress into an earlier life. Well, what happens is that as he gets more and more into this, that he not only is doing it psychologically regressing, but his body is changing into an earlier form. Well, honest to God, I sat in that theater and I think I, there were only about four people in the whole theater, how popular the movie was. Mm -hmm. And there was just this feeling of evil. I don't, it was the weirdest feeling. I was shivering. Uh, I was so frightened uh, what was happening in this movie that it was, it, there was a feeling, I don't know how, do you have a feeling of something being evil? I mean, I don't know if you've ever been in a place or a situation or encountered something where there just is this feeling of evil. And I, I let, that was the only movie I have ever walked out on in my entire life. Because I said, I have to get out of this theater. It was just so terrifying. Now, quite a number of years later, it was on TV and I ended up watching it on TV. Maybe it was a safer environment. 
because it was a lighted room rather than a darkened theater. And then it was just like one of those stupid movies again. Mm. And I could see it in a way that didn't terrify me or I didn't have the feeling of evil. A part of the reason of telling you that, and maybe if you've had those kinds of experiences or encounters where you find yourself in a place where you don't really think you should be, because there's just something about that place that is terrifying and scary and frightening. And the presence that you feel in that is, is something that could overpower you uh, at any moment. Um, anyway, um, I tell, again, I tell you that because in this story today for the first uh, Sunday of Len, um, I vacillated over the weeks uh, in conversation with our Bible study on Wednesday night um, and in different places, because in the old tradition that this uh, story is as even the prayers and the whole idea of temptation, that in tradition, it's always been like Jesus is being tempted to sin because Jesus can't sin. Therefore, the temptation, well, think in your own life, right? Even the prayers. Well, we were tempted to sin um, in, in so many different ways. And gosh, I mean, I could go on for a long time thinking about the temptations and naming them. And as a good pastor, of course, it's always what you as a congregation are tempted to sin. So you all got to stop sinning out there because you make my life more difficult as pastor if you sin and don't follow what I'm telling you, you should follow. That's probably how many of us have heard it, right? Yeah. The perspective of the pastor saying those kinds of things. Well, in the Bible study and, and in the e-sojourner that I sent out, I changed the word from temptation to being tested. That something in the story is suggesting that and, and what you need to know is the scene right before this is the baptism of Jesus, where he now accepts, as Matthew understands it anyway, accepts this mission uh, to be the agent of God's reign on, on earth so that he's baptized and then is sent, as how our story today begins, sent into the wilderness uh, to, to fast. So the response that is made is that there's a period after the baptism of self-reflection, but the self-reflection comes in the form of this encounter. And it's interesting, right? In the reading, the first word was used was tempter, and then it went to, to the devil. And in some translations, it's also said as Satan. We all have some kinds of ideas about Satan, right? Just even in the lectionary, the first reading for today is the reading from Genesis, where the, the Satan, the Satan, tempts the, the man and the woman uh, to violate God's command not to eat of the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Uh, and because the, the man and the woman see the fruit is, well, the woman, she's the cause of it, right, in the story, that the woman sees the fruit as good and pleasing and desirous. And so she chomps down on the, on the fruit, even though most people believe in apple, even though it's not said in the text, right? And so the story suggests, in, not in Hebrew or Jewish tradition, but it becomes the text that Christians pick up on in Paul, in Roman, and then Augustine, where this is all about the origins of sin. And so somehow or another, the goodness of God's creation is destroyed or disrupted or broken by the act of disobedience of the first man and the woman. And now we're all plagued to, to, uh, to be sinful people. And that's how Christian tradition is developed. So that's why, you know, you may have heard that, you know, it's because of your failings and your sins uh, and your disobedience. And that's what you've got to change and you need more discipline in your life and so forth and so forth, right? So it becomes a very personal uh, thing. You know, my personal failings and faults, and that's what I got to put before my eyes uh, and recognizing my own individual faults and failings somehow is meant to get me. And of course, you know where it's going, right? That it's meant to get me not only closer to God, that's one uh, focus point, but it's another that, well, 
what was me if I die before I've confessed these sins and given up them? Because then, well, either I'll go right to hell uh, or uh, end up, as Catholics believe, purgatory, the way station between heaven and hell, where you, even in the afterlife, you have to seek some kind of purging of your life. Well, you know, please ignore most of what I've just all said. Uh, because there's something deeper as I come to think about it. And I told you those stories, especially the one about altered states, because I think there's something that we do have to pay attention here. And, and I'm not going to push it too far to say that the story suggests there are two forces. And, and I could verge on, this is your $100 theological word for the day. Um, I converge on the Manich Manichaean heresy, where the Manichaean heresy said that there are two forces of equal power, one good and one bad. And so sometimes, sort of like yin and yang, right? That there's a, a dark side and a light side. Sort of like, you know, that Star Wars didn't have anything on the Manichaeans. Star Wars, in, you know, the, the force for good and the force for evil, uh, and, and that these two forces are in conflict with each other. Well, whatever it may be, there is something about this that I want to suggest is important for us to reflect on. And I'm not going to push the, the two opposing forces too far. But what I want you to consider is the response that Jesus makes to what he's being tested to do. Now, the scholars suggest that if you were to really look at the Hebrew scripture, that the three tests, and notice that Jesus is mostly the quote back to the tempter, is from the book of Deuteronomy. Um, but the, what, what he's being tested with are the tests of ancient Israel. So that through their history, from the time that they're liberated from slavery, is their life following that liberation was meant to be lived in accord with the vision uh, of God, with the purposes uh, and intent of God in the world. But they continually make choices because they're being tested in the, in the wilderness. They're tested, you know, we've been out here 40 years. Oh, sounds familiar, doesn't it? 40 years, and we don't have anything more to eat. What are you going to do about that, God? And manna comes and water out of the rock. You know, we, we've been tested by looking at the ways of Pharaoh and all of the potentates around us, and we want our king to have power. We've been tested, and boy, when they went down that path, it ended up in them being exiled within a few hundred years. So much for that. We, so that these testings of Jesus come and look at his response. And here's what I want us to consider. Here's, here's this is a $500 theological word. <laughs> I've just given this because it's just something to reflect upon. Whether it means much now or it might mean more, you're driving over the 202 to wherever you're going, to the Renaissance Fair, or wherever you're going, and that, you know, you go, oh, wow, Pastor Vernon talked about this today. You know, I just always tell people, make sure you pull off to the side of the road uh, because God might be texting you and you got to be able to pick up the message, right? No, I'm just kidding. But so, so the reflection, because the challenge is that if Jesus is being tested by an evil Power, the tempter, the devil, Satan. How is that possible? If God, if the beginning of Genesis tells us that God created everything and saw that it was good, where does evil come in? Does God create evil? No, because the scripture doesn't say that. You could say, that evil comes by that choice of the man and the woman in the garden. So evil comes then. But if you look at the whole schema of human history, that this has been a problem for humans from the very beginning. 
in terms of the force that opposes the goodness of the person seems at times to be equal or more powerful to that force for goodness. But where does that come from? And so around the, did anybody, have anybody heard the, the, the name Leibniz? He's, he's this philosopher, and that was probably the philosophy class that I skipped uh, in college. But he's this philosopher who comes up, he coins the word, and here's this big word. He coins the word theodicy. Does anybody, please, liberal brains don't explode on me, all right? Um, but he coins the word theodicy because he has to try to figure out how if God is good, how does evil enter into reality or into human life that we have to justify the existence of evil in the great scheme of things in terms of God's goodness? Because it, it's obvious that evil attacks the goodness of God and attacks the goodness in us in some fashion that corrupts the goodness of God and corrupts the goodness in us and destroys, as the Genesis story tells, destroys this shalom, this balance that is meant to exist within creation. And so Leibniz calls it the Odyssey. And I've got uh, the Wikipedia um, handout that's 20 pages long on the Odyssey. It, it was just, it's like, I began to fog over and fall asleep because it was just like, oh my God, there is, people are spending time trying to figure out what the Odyssey is about. And there are hundred, even there's the Odyssey from a Jewish perspective, the Odyssey from a Muslim perspective, and, and by the way, the Buddhists and the Hindus don't have this because they've already got it figured out that karma and the whole that, you know, they don't have any idea. They don't talk about evil in that sense. There's just this reality that we live in. So there. So so if anybody wants to read this, they can go through 20 pages of the idea of the Odyssey. But here's here's what I want us to think about. It's clear to me, especially in the last years, that I don't want to, I'm not going to, I'll say it, but don't hear me say it with conviction, that we're being confronted with evil. Whether it's human individuals who are so uh, ensconced in their, uh, their view of hate, uh, and violence, uh, that there are individuals, you know, whether we could name them, and again, you could look back through history, um, individuals whose focus is so uh, on themselves and their power, that that focus of their power and their destroys people, destroys lives. I mean, just look at what's happening in Ukraine, right? I mean, communities wiped out, wiped out. Um, or, or you look back 70 plus years ago uh, to the Holocaust uh, and the effect of 6 million Jews plus millions of homosexuals and gypsies and political prisoners who died in concentration camps at the hands of what you might say was an evil uh, person, so that evil can be personified, but evil exists within our experience in, in many ways, right? Uh, I mean, you know, I'll, I'll say it. In some ways, I'm, it's almost like whether it's TikTok or Facebook or Twitter or whatever it might be, that sometimes you just get sucked in to a, an attitude towards other people and towards the world that just leads one to be so filled with anger that it leads people to attack the Capitol building 
Mm. Because of, of, the, of the way that this connection filtered through their lives and fed on their own anger and, and hate, that it, it just, it, it took hold of them in some fashion. And it's got hold of us still in many ways. That, that we think that the only way to resolve, to respond to evil or to resolve the conflicts created by evil is to engage in more violence and more evil, which doesn't solve the problem at all, does it? And so in the scripture, when the tempter is testing Jesus to not only adopt the worldview that he's saying, and we know what's the agenda behind what the tempter is offering, right? Put yourself in a position of control and power and domination uh, and magically turning stones into bread. Put your, and guess what? You're gonna be better than anybody else. You're gonna be more powerful than anybody else. And you're gonna be able to command the world for yourself. Well. Think about that. I mean, there are many ways in our daily life that we're invited to consider taking on that kind of perspective and that kind of stand where we're better than everybody else. And so, you know, that you cut me off on the highway and I'm going to show you who you are, you know, whether we shame people or we, you know, um, put people down. I mean, that's all a part of what this is about. Now, I don't want to leave you just with that. Because surprisingly, a couple, just last week, and, and it kind of came, last week, I picked up uh, this book that I had bought uh, a while ago. I think I bought the book at uh, the Martin Luther King uh, Jr. Memorial in Atlanta in their bookstore. Um, and it's a, a book about Gandhi. And I mean, you know, I saw what was the Gandhi, the movie uh, with Ben Kingsley as Gandhi. Uh, and I knew a little bit about Gandhi, but at the back of the book, because we know that Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., whether he initially um, knew anything about Gandhi, but certainly we know that he was influenced by, uh, by Gandhi's. Uh, philosophy of nonviolence. Um, and I knew about that, but I didn't know that a part of what this is about is what he said was his belief, in, and I'm not gonna pronounce it correct, which is Satyagraha. And Satyagraha is a way of life that entails and a part of Satyagraha is ahimsa. If you heard that word, ahimsa is the Hindu word for nonviolence. And and here's here's a, a fabulous uh, paragraph from the book. And he says this. He says he's going to give um, a tip. And and the tip is that when you find yourself in a situation of being confronted by violence or evil or hate, how do you respond to it? And he said, consider this. He says, whenever you are in doubt, or when the self becomes too much with you, try the following expedient. Meaning when, if you're in doubt and you're confronted, so how am I going to act? What my, is my response? Do I engage in violence? You know, so if somebody hits me and I'm going to sock them back because that's, or, you know, if myself, you know, I'm, I'm too proud, I'm too uh, protective of myself. So therefore I'm going to take advantage of that to your disadvantage. So he says it is, it's fascinating. He says, recall the face of the poorest and most helpless person whom you have seen. Recall the face of the poorest and the most helpless person who you may have seen 
and ask yourself if the step you contemplate is going to be of any use to that person. Isn't that interesting? I drive by homeless people on the street all the time. And so I have to ask myself, here's the question, is what I'm thinking about in terms of violence, responding to evil, how is that going to benefit that person? Will he or she be able to gain anything by my action? Will it restore them to a control over their own life and destiny? Will it give them dignity? Will my act of violence against violence give them any dignity? Will it lead to their self-rule for hunger, for food? Uh, and, and we'll do that. And so he's speaking to the, to the millions of people in India. Will response to British rule, if it's in violence, what is that really going to do to the poor person in our country? Will it accomplish anything for them? Or is it just for our benefit? Think of if, if that was what Putin was thinking, that the poorest person in Russia, will the poorest person in Russia benefit from his conquering the Ukraine? Will he sending them tanks and weapons and instruments? Will that action help the poorest person in Ukraine? It may secure their freedom, but will it ultimately help that poor person gain anything back? From it. And so I began to think, you know, wow, in Jesus's response to the tempter, is he doing that? Well, really. But at the beginning of this journey towards Jerusalem at the end, it might be giving us a pause to think that in our overall scheme of life, What's our responses to our encounter with hate and violence and war and whatever else we get upset about, whatever else, you know, clicks our clock and we just go berserk over it? Will our response in a negative way help that person, poorest person that we've encountered gain back their dignity? I don't know. That's a question to think about. Beginning of Lent. <laughs>